Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Plunging Below the Surface, Understanding and Treating Anxiety and Depression in Tourette and Tic Disorders. My name is Angela Sullivan, CDC Program Coordinator, and I will be your moderator for this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tread Health and Education Program, a program of the Tread Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During tonight's webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Michael Himley. Dr. Himley is a clinical psychologist and associate professor of psychology at the University of Utah. He is an expert in behavioral approaches for understanding and treating tick disorders and related conditions. He has published more than 60 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters and has given more than 100 conference presentations and invited talks on Tourette syndrome and related conditions. His research has received funding from the Tourette Association of America and the National Institutes of Health. He serves as the on the Medical Advisory Board and Behavioral Sciences Consortium for the TAA and is the director of the University of Utah TAA Designated Center for, of Excellence for Tourette Syndrome. Without further ado, Dr. Himley, please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you, Angela, uh, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight talking with all of you about a topic that um, I find myself addressing more and more within the Tourette community, uh, especially over the past uh, few years. Um, this is especially timely, I think, because the holiday season just got over and that can be uh, an especially stressful time for all of us and especially for people who are struggling with anxiety and depression, which are the topics that we're going to talk about today. So we will indeed plunge right in or jump right in. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Tourette syndrome iceberg, as you know, the motor and vocal tics. The involuntary motor and vocal tics are the defining feature of Tourette syndrome, but Tourette syndrome for many people involves a lot more than that. And in particular, a lot of people struggle with issues related to anxiety and depression, which are both problems with mood or emotion. These are two disorders that we call internalizing disorders, which means that the signs and symptoms are emotional or internal. Uh, they involve thoughts and they involve feelings. Um, and so they're not readily observable to other people. So a lot of times they go unnoticed and they remain hidden, which is part of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and because they're emotional disorders, they are affected by and affect pretty much everything that we do. So if we look at the Tourette syndrome iceberg, we see right here we have anxiety and depression. And although this, this diagram isn't intended to uh, size things according to their impact, um, I do just want to highlight how, how uh, important it is to consider uh, mood when we're looking at Tourette syndrome. So we have anxiety and we have depression and also on this iceberg below the surface we have obsessive compulsive disorder um, which is no longer classified in our diagnostic manual as an anxiety disorder but definitely has anxiety as one of the primary components. So aside from anxiety disorders and depression and OCD per se, uh, we know that uh, things like bullying for example can impact self-esteem and can lead to depression and anxiety. Uh, sleep, sleep has a really, really important role when it comes to managing our mood. Anxiety and depression are both associated with sleep problems and sleep problems can actually trigger or worsen both anxiety and depression. Learning disabilities and difficulties with school or occupational problems can also lead to anxiety and, and problems with depression or exacerbate those conditions. Social skills deficits, uh, especially when it comes to things like social anxiety, are impacted by our mood. Uh, we know that things like behavioral issues and ADHD can lead to anxiety or mood problems. And we also know that both the motor and vocal tics are impacted by things like anxiety. A lot of people experience worsening of, the, of, of their tic symptoms when they are stressed or when they're anxious. So, Really, if we look at this iceberg, uh, anxiety and depression are two really, really important factors that have wide-ranging impact 
on a lot of different symptoms. Uh, we know from the research that the rate of anxiety and depressive disorders uh, within Tourette syndrome are higher than they are in the general population. Um, so in this table, what you're seeing in the first column are depressive and anxiety disorders. And in the second column, it's showing the rate of these disorders in the general population. And in the third column, you see the rate within tick disorders. And so if we look at depression, for example, depression occurs in about 4% of children and 10 to 15% of adolescents, and also about 5 to 10% of adults. But if we look at the rate within the tick disorder population, we see that it's almost two to three times more common than it is in the general population. If you look at anxiety disorders, we see uh, something very similar. Each one of the anxiety disorders, and we'll go into some of these later in the presentation, occur in about two to 5% of the population. Some of them are a little bit more common. Um, but if we look at lifetime history of any anxiety disorder, we see that uh, about 10% of children are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, about 30% of adolescents and about 20% of adults. But when we look within the Tourette population, again, we see 30 to 40% uh, of individuals with Tourette have uh, an anxiety disorder. Uh, same thing with OCD. Uh, OCD occurs in about one to two, maybe 3% of children, depending on the study that you look at. But the rates within tick disorders are 20 to 40%. Um, in addition to being more prevalent within uh, the tick disorder population, we know that anxiety and depression are also highly comorbid with each other. So comorbidity refers to two disorders that uh, occur alongside each other. So we know that about 50 to 60% of those with an anxiety disorder will also meet criteria for depression. And the same thing can be said for people with depression. About 50 to 60% of those with depression also meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. So there's a lot of overlap uh, both between these conditions and with tick disorders. And that's part of what we're going to talk about as we go through this presentation. So um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is why? Why do we see such high rates of anxiety and depression and other comorbidities uh, in those who have ticks? And the truth is we don't know for sure, but there's likely multiple reasons. Uh, one is that uh, some of them appear to, to possibly be genetically linked. So for example, with OCD, we know that individuals who have uh, a parent with a tick disorder are more likely to have OCD even if they don't have ticks. And uh, individuals who have ticks are more likely to have parents who had OCD who didn't have ticks. So we know that there's potentially a genetic link there. Um, and there could be a genetic link with other uh, comorbidities as well. We know that they, some of these share similar brain structures and neurotransmitters. So we know that with Tourette, a big part of uh, what we, we assume or we think is uh, not functioning properly is the dopamine system. And dopamine is a really important neurotransmitter. Um, it's involved not just in movement, but also in things like the processing of reward. So uh, dopamine is very, very active when you're doing things that are pleasurable, when you're doing things that um, are followed by um, satisfying outcomes or reward. And one of the theories, for example, with depression is that individuals uh, are prone to start avoiding situations or activities that used to be pleasurable, that used to, to provide reward. And so uh, there's a link there potentially between depression and the reward system in the brain. Um, that reward system involves other neurotransmitters as well, such as serotonin and norepinephrine. And so those neurotransmitters may be involved. And um, so, so that's something to, that research is continuing to look at. Uh, anxiety and depression could be secondary consequences of having Tourette for some individuals. So it's, it can be very stressful to live with ticks. Uh, there were some, some new data came out through the Tourette Association showing high rates of bullying. Um, and other social consequences. And we know that those things put an individual at risk for developing anxiety and depression. So uh, for some individuals, uh, anxiety and uh, mood problems can be the consequence of having to live uh, with these uh, observable tick symptoms. And it could be that for some of them, there are simply co-occurring problems. So we know, for example, that phobias um, don't appear to have any obvious link with Tourette syndrome, but they're relatively common uh, in the general population. And so we would expect the same thing to be true 
uh, for individuals who have Tourette. Uh, in other words, Tourette doesn't necessarily protect you against having something like a phobia or generalized anxiety disorder or depression, which are all common in the general population. So individuals with Tourette are just as likely as others, um, and it turns out even, even more so to uh, experience depression, problems with depression and anxiety. Uh, in terms of cause, um, we really, we could go into an entire webinar on what we uh, assume or think might be the cause of these, but um, we need to take into account and assume that both biological and psychosocial factors, things like stress and life experiences interact uh, to determine who is going to develop anxiety and depression. Right now, we're not very good the, the, at identifying, especially in kids, who is gonna go on to develop, for example, OCD, or who's gonna go on to develop generalized anxiety disorder. Um, about the best we can do is look at risk factors, and we know that motor and vocal tics are risk factors, and we also know that family history is a strong risk factor. Um, there are some others uh, that we're starting to investigate, things like um, shyness and inhibition uh, in the early school years that may be predictors of anxiety and depression, but we're, we still have a long way to go in terms of figuring that out. But um, this uh, combination of biological and psychosocial factors is something we call the diathesis stress model or the nature nurture model. And it assumes that uh, kids with Tourette syndrome uh, have um, some biological uh, risk factors. And then when those are coupled with uh, stressful life experiences or other environmental factors, um, that increases the risk. So why do we need to talk about anxiety and depression right now? It, it, as I mentioned earlier, these are internalizing disorders and they often go overlooked and this is really unfortunate. And This is a part of why I'm really happy to be giving this webinar today. Um, collectively, when we look at anxiety and problems with anxiety and depression, these are the most common illnesses in the United States. Uh, if we consider them together, uh, they affect over 40 million adults, and the rates are even higher in Tourette, and most cases start in childhood. Um, there's an increased risk for suicide, for substance abuse, and other dangerous and concerning problems, and chronic stress uh, negatively impacts physical health. So this isn't just a problem of the mind. This isn't something where you can just stop having depression or stop having anxiety. Um, we know that both anxiety and depression are related to stress and that stress can negatively impact your physical health and so we really need to be talking about anxiety and depression and uh, helping individuals get the help that they need um, for example we know that stress uh, accelerates aging we know that it's associated with chronic disease things like obesity it's associated with hypertension and heart disease uh, and in fact individuals who have anxiety problems and, and problems with their mood are six to eight times more likely um, to see a doctor within any given year for a physical health problem. Um, I actually heard a statistic recently that said that about 80% of primary care doctor visits um, are in some way related to a stress-based problem. So this is a major problem and we need to do something about it. Unfortunately, only about 30% of individuals who have depression and anxiety get treatment. And among those who do, only about a third get best available recommended evidence-based interventions. And so that's part of what I'm going to talk about today are these evidence-based interventions. These are interventions that have been researched and have been shown to work and reduce the symptoms of anxiety and depression. So the goals of today's webinar are to start a conversation about anxiety and depressive disorders uh, within the Tourette population. And I hope to address a few of what I see as some of the barriers to care. Um, and some of these barriers are a lack of recognition. Um, my guess is that there are a lot of you out there who have been diagnosed with anxiety or depression, and that's great. Um, unfortunately, um, you're, you're in the minority. The vast majority of people who struggle with anxiety and depression are never diagnosed. They never talk with their doctor about this problem. Um, they don't recognize it oftentimes as even being a problem until it gets really pretty severe. Um, the second is just stigma. Uh, the stigma that comes along with the diagnosis, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, uh, and then the lack of information about care. And, and that's what I hope to present to you today, is what treatments are available, what you should be looking for in a treatment, and how to know if you're getting uh, evidence-based care. So how we're going to address these today is we're going to talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms, and then we're going to talk about how we should be thinking about anxiety and depression. These are 
are not just mental problems. These are not just problems um, that occur inside the head. These are physical problems, they're behavioral problems, um, and they're environmental problems. And then we're going to talk about evidence-based treatment and what to look for in treatment. So with that said, uh, let's jump right in. So what is anxiety? Uh, that sounds like kind of a silly question. Most of us uh, know what we think of when we think of anxiety, but if you really, really stop and think about it and you ask yourself, what is anxiety? Um, it's, a, it's a complicated topic. Uh, it, there's not a single definition that really seems to capture everybody's experience with anxiety. A lot of people, when you ask them what is anxiety, will talk about fear. Um, but anxiety is about a lot, is about more than just fear. So when we think about fear, we think about this is a physiological response to an immediate threat. So if you're walking down a dark alley, somebody jumps out behind you, your heart starts pounding, you you start to sweat, uh, blood starts rushing to your to your limbs and gets you ready for fight or flight. Um, but when it comes to anxiety, it's about more than that. And so. When we think about anxiety, we think about these feelings of worry or nervousness or unease, um, typically about uh, an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So this is a fear about the future or anticipation about the future and an uneasiness that comes along with the not knowing what outcomes are, are ahead of us. Uh, related terms that people use to describe anxiety, especially in kids, are things like worry and uneasiness and nervousness and tension, uh, also things like fear and uncertainty and doubt. So these are all complicated um, topics that are used pretty interchangeably. And it's important to remind ourselves that everybody experiences some anxiety, and that's actually a good thing. Anxiety is perfectly normal. Um, in fact, it's predictable, especially in children and adolescents. Uh, we can predict at what age most children will be, for example, afraid of the dark or afraid of the boogeyman um, or afraid to be separated from their parents. And so things like uh, fear of separation and fear of the dark and fear of bad things happening to parents, these are all really predictable. And most children go through developmental stages where they experience some fear this can be concerning to parents, but usually what happens is it resolves as the child starts to age. Then when we get into adolescence, we start to see some more sophisticated fears and anxieties show up. We start to see things like anxieties about the future, about career, um, about the world, about politics. Um, jump on any newscast right now, and it's all full of doom and gloom and things that you should be worried about. And so these are the things that adolescents really struggle with. And this is really predictable. And a lot of times, again, it, it passes with time and doesn't really become a problem. Um, in fact, it's a good thing that we experience anxiety. Anxiety motivates us. A little bit of anxiety is what encourages us to sit down and prepare for webinars or sit down um, and do our homework if we're kids uh, to take things seriously. So anxiety can be a good thing, um, but unfortunately for some individuals, it gets out of hand. And when it does get out of hand, when it starts to become problematic, that's when you might have an anxiety disorder. Um, the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is now in its fifth revision, uh, lists several different anxiety disorders. Uh, the anxiety disorders are a collection of problems that share features of excessive fear and anxiety and related behavioral disturbances. Um, and so the key here is that the fear and the anxiety are excessive or they persist beyond developmentally normal periods. So if you have a child who's four, five, six, seven years old, who's starting school, especially at the beginning of the school year, and they're expressing some separation anxiety, this may be perfectly normal. Um, where it becomes abnormal or potentially problematic is when it gets to the point where the anxiety is really quite severe. Um, the child's unable to go to school, they're being sent home from school, and especially if it persists into the uh, later school years. Um, the same thing with adults. Some anxiety is perfectly normal if you are switching jobs or moving to a new city or experiencing some major stressor, um, uh, perhaps a, an evaluation at work, some anxiety around that is perfectly normal. Uh, if you start missing work because of your anxiety or enduring work and not performing um, to your capabilities because of anxiety, that's where we start to see problems show up. 
Um, so to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, the fear has to be excessive or persist beyond developmentally normal periods. It also has to be more than just situational. So anxiety is persistent. It's something that sticks around. Um, it's not just around a single event. And it, it needs to interfere with life in some way. And so it can interfere with your social life, with academics, with occupation, family functioning, uh, with relationships, or any other important areas of functioning. So if your anxiety meets these criteria, if this sounds like it describes you, um, it may be time to think about being evaluated for a possible anxiety disorder. Within the DSM, um, there are several anxiety disorders. I'm not, actually not going to go through all of the symptoms of each one of these, um, but I did want to just review them. Uh, separation anxiety disorder, which is a lot of anxiety around being separated from um, attachment figures. Uh, most commonly, we see this in kids and adolescents, but you can also see this in adults as well. Um, social anxiety disorder, as the name implies, is a lot of anxiety around social situations where one might be evaluated um, or be judged. Uh, panic disorder is, is a slightly different anxiety disorder. This involves uh, unexpected intense bouts of fear and panic. Um, generalized anxiety disorder are the worry warts. These are the people who worry about a lot of different things. Um, a lot of times generalized anxiety disorder shows up as more cognitive things like rumination, things like uh, going over and over, not being able to let things go. Um, with kids, we call this a case of the what ifies. Uh, they're always asking, what if this, what if this, what if this? Um, phobias are anxiety around a really specific thing, things like animals, uh, insects, uh, thunderstorms, etc. Um, and then one that I think is relevant um, for a lot of individuals with uh, Tourette and tic disorders are substance or medication induced anxiety disorders. Um, so we do need to keep in mind that some medications have as a side effect uh, increased anxiety. Uh, we also um, see anxiety disorders show up some, uh, in, in things like substance intoxication. So alcohol intoxication can induce anxiety problems. Chronic alcohol use uh, can induce anxiety problems, um, as can, with, as can uh, withdrawal uh, from both alcohol and a number of other um, drugs. And then finally, selective mutism, which is a fear to, to speak uh, in to unfamiliar people. So these are the the primary anxiety disorder classifications um, that are listed in the DSM-5. There are several other disorders that have anxiety as an important feature, and these include things like obsessive compulsive disorder, which involves uh, unwanted, repetitive uh, thoughts, images, or impulses that create anxiety. So unwanted thoughts about things that make you anxious, and then repetitive acts that we call compulsions, uh, to neutralize the anxiety or prevent something bad from happening. Post-traumatic stress disorder can have anxiety as a primary component. This is a, um, an emotional response to um, a, a dangerous or life-threatening event. Uh, anxiety is also important to consider in things like externalizing disorders, especially in kids. We see this all the time that kids come in and it looks like they're misbehaving. It looks like they're not listening. It looks like they're being deliberately defiant, um, especially when we see things like rage attacks, which are extreme reactions that are out of proportion to um, the, the provocation or the trigger. Uh, a lot of times, a part of what these kids are dealing with are problems with anxiety. Um, anxiety is relevant for eating disorders. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, sleep disorders often have anxiety as a component. Uh, so it's really difficult sometimes to tease apart is the sleep deprivation uh, causing the anxiety or is anxiety causing sleep or are the two interacting in some way, which is usually the case. And then also mood disorders, which we'll talk about in more detail in just a little bit. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that one of the reasons that we see um, or that people report for the why they don't get help with things like anxiety and depression is stigma. Um, and a lot of that stigma comes around diagnosis, uh, the label, being labeled with having an anxiety disorder, being labeled with having um, depression. And so we also see that a lot of times patients and parents can get a little bit hung up on trying to figure out what the most appropriate diagnosis is. And that's a really great question, um, but sometimes it can be really difficult to know. 
Um, and even the best doctors can disagree about the most appropriate diagnosis. And this can be really, really frustrating um, for parents. And I think that sometimes this frustration um, is a little bit uh, misguided in that the assumption is that if we can determine the most appropriate diagnosis, it's going to tell us something about why, um, why this is happening. It's going to it's going to give us that cause, and that's just really not the purpose of a diagnosis. Um, the purpose of a diagnosis is, is really just to describe the specific symptoms that an individual is dealing with. And so the different anxiety disorders have both unique and shared features and symptoms. And so diagnosis is really a way for doctors and for patients and for parents and for uh, the public to talk about a collection of symptoms. So each one of those anxiety disorders that I just described has a slightly different symptom profile. So if I'm talking with another physician uh, about some about a case uh, that is described as having OCD, that's a shorthand way for us to really understand what it is that we're talking about. Um, but the other thing that it can do is it can give us some information about what treatments we might try first. So when we think about a diagnosis, the key things to keep in mind is that each disorder has a unique profile. Um, these are disorder-specific characteristics, but they also have shared characteristics, uh, things that, that go beyond just a single diagnosis. It's also important to keep in mind that each individual has a unique, what I call, anxiety fingerprint. So even when you have a diagnosis, it doesn't tell us the whole picture. The diagnosis is a piece of the puzzle. Um, and sometimes it's a big piece of the puzzle, um, but it doesn't tell us everything. We need the rest of the pieces of the puzzle to really understand a person's anxiety fingerprint. And these are the individual characteristics that describe a person's anxiety. And as I mentioned earlier, if we can understand both the unique anxiety profile and the individual's anxiety fingerprint, we can use that information in treatment planning. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about next. So let's talk a little bit about some of these unique and shared characteristics that we see within the anxiety disorders. Um, for example, uh, in generalized anxiety disorder, the unique symptoms here are excessive worry and apprehension about lots of everyday things. Contrast that with obsessive compulsive disorder that involves intrusive thoughts and images and impulses, and then these repetitive acts to neutralize that anxiety that we call compulsions. And then contrast that with panic disorder, which is recurrent, unexpected panic attacks um, that are abrupt surges of intense fear or discomfort. So what you see in this, and you can go down the list and you see this for separation anxiety and social anxiety as well. What you see in this list are the unique symptoms that characterize each one of these anxiety disorders. But if you look at the far right column, what you also see are shared symptoms that oftentimes get overlooked. These are the symptoms that a lot of times people don't understand or they don't talk about or they assume are related to something else, but oftentimes are related to the anxiety. And these include things like avoidance, things like muscle tension, fatigue, sleep problems, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, which just means that you um, tend to startle really easily and you tend to um, if, if an anxiety provoking situation comes up, you notice it very, very quickly. Um, things like sweating and then other physical symptoms, things like numbness, tingling, lightheadedness, GI problems, shortness of breath. Um, so these symptoms can actually cut across all of the different anxiety disorders um, and are just as important to consider as the specific characteristics that define disorder. So a useful way to think about this um, is that kind of gets outside of the diagnosis is to think about the different components of anxiety disorders, right? So hopefully, you know, in thinking about what the diagnosis is intended for, um, we can reduce a little bit of that stigma. It's just a label for symptoms that you're that an individual is experiencing. But when we think about those symptoms, we whenever we think about any emotional disorder, whether it's anxiety or depression or anger or irritability. We know that how we feel is affected by how we think, and it's affected by how we act, and it's affected by our physical state. Um, so when we think about anxiety disorders, we need to take into account contextual factors and triggers. These are things like your occupation. Are you working a really stressful job? Is it a job associated with high burnout? Um, have there been problems at work? Relationships. Relationships are key. 
Uh, how are relationships going? Are, are they healthy? Do you have people you can talk to? Um, people that will listen, people that um, don't judge. Socioeconomic factors, uh, things like where you live. Do you live in a high crime neighborhood? Do you live in a safe neighborhood? This also involves things like finances, uh, which can be a major stressor, especially for adults and parents. Uh, and then we just need to take into account other stressors and things that, that trigger anxiety. So all of these things are, are factors that can contribute to the development of an anxiety uh, problem. Within the individual, we consider cognitive, behavioral, and, and physical factors. And cognitive factors that cut across the anxiety disorders include things like ruminating and worrying, um, assuming the worst, overestimating the likelihood that bad things will happen. Um, for both anxiety and depression, I like to talk about the anxiety goggles and the depressive sunglasses. Um, the anxiety goggles are people with anxiety disorders tend to really quickly find the negatives and all the things that could go wrong, all the reasons that something won't work, all the threats that are out there in the world. Um, but when you take those glasses off, you realize that, that there are aren't that many threats and that um, perhaps the probability of bad things happening are less than we think. From a behavioral standpoint, anxiety is characterized by things like avoidance and reassurance seeking, right? These are the parts of anxiety that we sometimes do see. And then physically, we see things like shaking and trembling and muscle tension. And we're going to come back to this diagram in a little bit um, and explain why I think this is a really important thing for us to consider. So what about depression? Uh, depression also more complicated than it sounds. The defining feature of depression is sad and empty or irritable mood, um, along with somatic, meaning physical uh, and cognitive changes. Um, so one of the key features of the depressive disorders is that the way the person is feeling, um, the depressive episode is a change from their usual baseline. Right, so most people with depression recognize that this is not how I normally feel. This is not how I want to feel. It's a departure uh, from the way that they have felt in the past. Um, like anxiety, everyone has periods of sadness, um, especially around grief uh, and things like loss, uh, and this is normal. Um, but when uh, a person is feeling down and depressed and sad chronically or, or most of the day, um, regardless of what's going on around them, then that may be in indicative of, an, of a depressive disorder. So within the DSM-5, there are several primary uh, categories of depressive disorders. Um, the one that you're perhaps most familiar with is major depressive disorder. Um, and this is a period of two weeks or more of depressed mood and loss of interest or pleasure in things that used to be pleasurable. Uh, not surprisingly, what that means is that most individuals with depression stop engaging in those activities. And so they stop coming into contact with a lot of the activities or the people um, or the stimuli that used to be rewarding to them, used to be reinforcing to them and gave them pleasure. Um, in addition to the depressed mood and the loss of interest or the anhedonia um, are several other symptoms and these include weight loss, sleep disturbance, uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation, uh, fatigue, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, uh, concentration problems, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal ideation plan or attempt. There's another category that's uh, sort of related to major depressive disorder but involves a longer period with fewer and requires fewer symptoms and that's persistent depressive disorder, or what we used to call dysthymia. And this is a depressed mood that occurs for most of the day for more days than not. Um, but rather than over a two week period, it needs to last for at least two years or for one year if in a child or adolescent. So this is a prolonged period of depressed mood and loss of interest and pleasure, um, along with a few of these other symptoms that persists for a long period of time and occurs more days than not. A new category to the DSM depressive disorder section is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And this is one that I'm really interested in um, to see how this uh, may or may not fit uh, some of the kids that we see who, who come to us with uh, complex comorbidity. Uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder was actually added to the DSM um, because a lot of children were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. 
and didn't fit the cyclical pattern that we see with bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a disorder that involves depressive episodes coupled with hypomanic or manic episodes. So really pretty quite severe mood swings. And so those it, it cycles in a sense. Um, hence the name bipolar. Uh, people experience both poles or both ends of the mood spectrum from manic all the way to depressed. And a lot of bipolar disorder is really difficult to diagnose in kids. And a lot of the kids that were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder weren't having these cyclical mood swings, but instead they were having periods of, de of depression along with a lot of irritability. And the question was whether that irritability was actually um, hypomanic or, or fit with the bipolar profile. What we actually found is that a lot of these kids who were diagnosed with bipolar early on were going on later in life to have uh, diagnoses of depression or anxiety um, versus kids who have classic bipolar disorder. That tends to be a disorder that, that sticks with you. It's a more chronic disorder. Um, and doesn't change a lot over time. And so um, they added this new category called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which involves recurrent temper outbursts um, manifested by verbal or physical aggression that are grossly out of proportion in intensity to the situation. Um, and you have to have three or more of these uh, each week. So these are pretty frequent episodes. And then between these episodes, uh, the child has a persistently irritable or angry mood most of the day um, that's observable to others. So this isn't just self-report kids who say they're, they're, they're irritated or they're upset. Um, parents are actually noticing that they never seem happy, that they always seem to be um, down in the dumps and, and gloomy. So um, this category is one that, that because it's new, we don't have a lot of research on it. Um, but a lot of people that I've that I've talked to feel like this diagnosis really seems to capture a part of what their child is experiencing. Uh, in addition, um, other DSM depressive disorders or other depressive disorders that are included in the DSM include substance and medication induced depressive disorder, just like with anxiety disorders. Some medications uh, have the side effect of depressed mood. Um, including some of the off-label tick suppressing meds have a side the potential side effect for depression uh, and then also uh, things like alcohol alcohol is a central nervous system depressant so not surprisingly um, especially people who have anxiety who are self-medicating with anxiety who are drinking a lot they're just basically dumping a central nervous system depressant um, on top of their anxiety problem and, and potentially making anxiety and depression worse uh, there's also something called an unspecified depressive disorder um, with one specifier that includes anxious distress, um, which really captures the overlap between anxiety and depression. And then some other disorders that have depression as a possible feature are the bipolar disorders that I already talked about, substance use and abuse disorders, and sleep. So just like with anxiety, I think stepping outside of the diagnostic system, um, when we think about how to conceptualize depression, again, we conceptualize this not as just something that's happening in, in a person's head. This isn't a disorder where a person can choose to not be depressed, can choose to just get themselves out of bed and put on a happy face and smile and get over it. Um, depression is a really complicated disorder. Again, we need to consider the contextual factors that are potentially triggering or exacerbating the depression. We need to think about cognitive, a person's cognitive style or cognitive factors, things like ruminating. Uh, people with depression tend to think in a very black or white, all or none way. Uh, things like um, cognitive slowness, difficulty concentrating, um, and difficulty finding solutions to problems. So these are all cognitive elements of depression. On the behavioral side, we see things like avoidance, decreased engagement in pleasurable activities. Not surprising when you lose interest in something and something doesn't seem pleasurable, you tend to stop doing it. Um, and then also social isolation. On the physical side, we see things like muscle aches, fatigue, heaviness, sleep problems, and appetite changes. So when you look at this, one of the reasons that I put this up for both anxiety and depression is because it really highlights the potential overlap here between these two um, disorders. On the one hand, with the anxiety disorders, we have specific symptoms like fear and hypervigilance and worry. And then with depression, we have the depressed mood and the loss of pleasure and interest. But then if you look at the overlap in the middle, we see that both anxiety and depression are characterized by irritability, 
and agitation and fatigue and GI problems and sleep problems and difficulty concentrating and avoidance of people and activities. Um, so it's not surprising this, this helps us understand why anxiety and depression are so common, but it also complicates the clinical picture. It makes it hard to know, are these symptoms best attributed to anxiety or are they better attributed to depression or does it even matter? Um, so this is just something uh, to keep in mind because it's relevant for treatment planning. So let's go ahead and, and spend the rest of the time talking a little bit about the treatments that are available. Um, both medication and psychotherapy have been shown to be effective for treating anxiety and depression. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, even though these are the most common of the psychiatric disorders and in fact are the most common of the illnesses that occur in our society, the vast majority of people don't seek out treatment. Um, lifestyle changes can also help, but often aren't enough. Things like exercise and healthy eating, socializing and stress management um, can all make things better. Uh, and for some people that's sufficient, but for most people um, it can make them feel better and it can get them on the, on the path towards uh, improvement, but um, might not be enough. Self-medication, um, I get asked about this a lot, self-medication with other psychoactive drugs, um, especially with alcohol and things like cannabis are really, really common. Um, unfortunately, this is a really slippery slope and is really risky. Um, alcohol use and abuse and other substance use and abuse disorders are exceptionally common in individuals with anxiety and depression. Um, and complicate the clinical picture uh, a lot. And so it can really complicate treatment. Um, so if you find yourself using or abusing substances um, because it makes you feel better so that you can tolerate things so that it decreases your anxiety, um, that's what we call functional use of drugs. And that's, it's, it's not a good idea. It's a dangerous um, path to take. Um, so medication and psychotherapy are the two primary options. Uh, most of the research shows that the two is probably better than either one alone, um, but there are some studies that have come out over the past decade or so showing that therapy might be better than medication, especially for mild to moderate um, anxiety and depression, but that medication may actually outperform or be necessary uh, for more severe cases. So. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that medication and therapy can interact both in good ways and in, in bad ways. As a general rule of thumb, it's okay to be on medication and, and go in and see a therapist. You can do both of them at the same time. One is not going to interfere with the other. There are some minor exceptions to that. Um, so for example, uh, people with panic disorder are often prescribed fast acting benzodiazepines like Xanax. Um, and a part of the treatment, the psychosocial treatment or the therapy for panic disorder um, is really learning to um, experience those symptoms and tolerate those symptoms and, and over time help those symptoms reduce. And so if you're using the medication um, so that you don't have anxiety, uh, it, can make it, it can make it harder to do the therapy. Um, so some medications can interfere with the goals of some therapies, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, medication and therapy um, are, are your best option. Uh, and some problems can interfere with therapy for others. So for example, um, working on anxiety is complicated uh, for people if the person's experiencing severe depression. Uh, there's a good treatment out there for tics that some of you may have heard of called CBIT. Um, CBIT can, can be complicated for people that have uh, depression as well. So sometimes it's the case that anxiety and depression um, can interact to interfere with treatment. So my best advice, the best advice I can give you is to go in and consult with both a physician and a therapist. Some, some therapists are very knowledgeable about the medication options that are out there and can refer you to a psychiatrist or a medical doctor who can prescribe those. And some medical doctors are really familiar with best available therapies. Um, but in my experience, uh, your best option is to consult with a medical doctor, uh, whether that be a pediatrician or a psychiatrist or neurologist um, for your medication options, and then consult with a therapist to talk about what non-medical options are available um, at the same time. As far as medications go, I'm not gonna go into all of the medications today. Um, this is likely review for many of you out there, um, but the, 
the common medications that are used to treat anxiety and depression are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The rationale for this is that serotonin levels are disrupted in anxiety and depression. And what these medications do is they keep more serotonin available uh, within the synapse, which is, is how our cells in our brain um, fire. It's, it's how they uh, communicate with each other. And so what this does is it actually makes more serotonin available, thereby increasing serotonin levels. Um, there are also other options like tricyclic antidepressants and the benzodiazepines are also commonly prescribed. So there are a lot of different medication options out there. We could do a whole webinar on, on what medications are available for anxiety and depression and how you make decisions about what's going to work. Um, the take home point is that something will work for almost everyone, but nothing works, but no single drug works for everyone. So a lot of times what we see is that you have to try maybe a couple different SSRIs before you find one that works, or maybe you try a couple different SSRIs and that doesn't work. And so you move on and try something else like a tricyclic or a selective or a serotonin and, and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor or some other medication. So again, it's really important to work with an experienced, um, physician who can talk you through your different medication options. So let's go ahead and talk about psychotherapy. This is one that's confusing for a lot of people. Um, there are several effective or evidence-based psychotherapies available for anxiety and depression. Many of them fall under the umbrella of cognitive behavior therapy. And this is a source of confusion for a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is that um, Parents will ask me or, or patients will ask me sometimes, like, how do I know if my if my doctor is doing CBT or if my therapist is doing CBT? Um, and the answer is if they're using a lot of acronyms and, and, and I'm only partly joking. Uh, CBT therapists really like their acronyms. Um, and so we have things like CBT and ERP and ACT and ABA. Um, what each of these actually stand for, CBT stands for cognitive behavior therapy. ERP stands for exposure and response prevention, which is a form of cognitive behavior therapy. ACT stands for acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a form of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, ABA stands for applied behavior analysis, which is closely related to CBT. Um, CBIT and HRT are actually really are tick specific treatments, but they're forms of cognitive behavior therapy. So we have all of these treatments out there. Um, we like to refer to them with these acronyms, but most of them fall under this umbrella of what we call cognitive behavior therapy. So how do you know if your therapist is doing cognitive behavior therapy? Uh, the, the easiest way to know is you ask. Um, but then the, the next way to know is to recognize what we actually do, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, the CBT isn't the only treatment that's available. There are some others that have an evidence-based interpersonal psychotherapy is one of them. Um, there are some, some other insight-based uh, therapies that have been shown to be effective. So here again, you need to find something that works with you, that makes sense for you, um, but they're out there and, and they do work. Uh, so what's what's common across all of these different psychotherapies, though, is that they're they're less about discovering why. So this isn't the old school lay on the couch three times a week to try to figure out what went wrong in childhood that you're now experiencing anxiety. Um, these are less about discovering why and more about learning specific skills to cope with and manage anxiety. And by learning to cope with and manage anxiety and depression, we actually see a reduction in the symptoms over time. So this is what CBT actually looks like, um, coming back to this uh, diagram that I showed you earlier. Um, CBT is a multi-pronged approach that tries to get at all of the different elements of anxiety and depressive disorders. So for example, to address contextual factors, it may involve a sleep intervention, uh, your doctor may encourage exercise, help you change your diet, eliminate or modify things that are triggering depressive episodes or or anxiety. Um, parents may learn skills for better interacting with their kids uh, when their kid expresses anxiety or when their kid is, is um, complaining about, about uh, being down in the dumps or sad. Um, or, or for adults, this may involve some, some couples therapy. It may involve working with uh, a spouse or a significant other to help them interact with you in a way that's, that's more healthy that will help to reduce anxiety and depression.
And then uh, individually, um, what these treatments do is they address the behavioral elements. They might include things like social skills, um, assertiveness training. With depression, one of the most effective interventions is something called behavioral activation. Um, and this is a pretty simple uh, activity scheduling treatment that involves helping people come into contact with things that are rewarding. So increasing engagement in pleasurable activities, it turns out, will uh, improve mood and decrease depressive symptoms. Um, and it may also involve uh, working on interpersonal skills. Uh, cognitive elements involve things like thought challenging, um, acceptance, mindfulness, uh, teaching people to recognize uh, their biases. So again, coming back to the anxiety and depressive goggles, helping people understand that they might be viewing things through uh, an anxiety filter or a depressive filter. And then to address the physical elements, it might involve things like relaxation, uh, learning to tolerate and experience uh, symptoms of anxiety. A lot of times, especially with panic disorder, what we see is that when a person starts to feel symptoms of anxiety, they start to have anxiety about their anxiety. And this tends to snowball the physical effects into a panic attack. Um, and also medication can help to address some of those physical physical elements of anxiety and depression as well. So the take home points for psychotherapy um, is that the purpose of these interventions is to change the way you feel by changing the way you think, act, and engage with others. And so to teach more adaptive ways of thinking, increase engagement in pleasurable activities and decrease avoidance, increase social engagement, decrease physical symptoms, and increase tolerance. And so if you're asking yourself if your treatment is working, it might getting the help that I need, um, the first thing is to assume and take the viewpoint that anxiety and depression are treatable conditions, right? So you should, you should start with the assumption that you can feel better or that your child can feel better. And in fact, anxiety and depression are among the few psychiatric conditions for which we have really strong evidence-based treatments. Right? So a lot of times when people ask me, I'm not sure if I'm getting the help I need, I ask, well, are you feeling better? And they say, I'm not sure. If you're not sure if you're feeling better, um, chances are you're not getting the help that you need. Uh, the assumption should be that these are disorders that can be treated and you can indeed feel better. You can learn to manage these conditions. So the goal is not to be symptom free, but to have normal levels of anxiety, a manageable mood and good coping skills. Um, but you should definitely expect to see improvement. Uh, besides that, uh, I just encourage you to do your research and have the discussion with your provider. So if you're not sure if treatment is working, ask your provider, do you think this treatment is working for me? What signs do you see that I'm improving or that my child is improving? Um, how, do I, how do we know that we're, we're on the right track? Therapy really should be a collaborative process. And then I just wanted to um, conclude today with a quick note before I take questions about suicide. Um, both anxiety and depressive disorders are associated with increased risk for suicide. Um, and some recent surveys that came out actually show that suicidal ideation is relatively common in Tourette. Um, I believe the statistic was something uh, along the lines of about half of adults uh, have at some point um, thought about suicide and about a third of kids with Tourette. Um, have thought about suicide. And this is really concerning. Suicidal talk, thoughts, and plans and actions should never be ignored. Um, and so I really encourage uh, both parents and those of you out here who are struggling um, to play it safe. If you're at risk, you really need to start that conversation. You need to have that discussion with your doctor. Um, and if you are listening today, thinking about somebody else, whether that's a child, um, or a relative or a significant other or a friend or a family member, um, you need to ask, right? Uh, so who is at risk? That's the first question I get. Well, how do I know if a person's at risk? Depression, anxiety, and Tourette are risk factors. And I think that that's the first thing to assume. Um, you're, you're not gonna do damage by asking uh, you know, previous, the biggest risk factors are previous attempts and current plan, but we can't know if a person has a plan unless we ask. So you know, we need to start that conversation with the doctor, with our friends and with our family members. If you're out there and you're in crisis, uh, most hospitals have a suicidal helpline that can assess your risk and, and help you. Um, and so if, if you don't know the number for your local hospital, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. 
um, at 1-800-273-TALK or just call 911. Um, suicide can be effectively managed, it can be effectively treated, um, but, but you need to take action. So with that, I'll leave you with just a few resources. Um, if you want to know more, I really encourage you to check out the Anxiety and Depression Association of America's homepage um, at adaa.org. They have a great website that has um, a tab that's called For the Public, where you can find doctors who do CBT and who treat anxiety and depression. Um, you can learn more about what these treatments look like. Um, here again is the information for the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, NAMI and SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, both also have really good websites where you can find support and get more information um, to better understand the signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression and um, what help looks like. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at those, and I didn't save quite as much time for questions as I hoped, but I do have a few minutes, and so I'm happy to take those questions now. Thank you, Dr. Hemley. We're now going to begin, the an begin answering the questions that were submitted during tonight's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the question pane on your control panel. If we are unable to get to everyone's questions, which we may not, there were quite a few, here at the Detroit Association, we have a full-time information and referral staff who can answer your questions as well by emailing support at Tourette.org or by calling one 888 So I will start off and read you a few questions, Dr. Hamley. Um, someone asked if, how does ADHD lead to anxiety? Yeah, it's a great question. Not everybody with ADHD experiences anxiety, but um, what we do see is that, that a lot of times people who have ADHD struggle socially, and um, over time what that can do is it can lead to things like social anxiety. Uh, you know, kids especially with ADHD sometimes struggle in school, and so they develop things like test anxiety and anxiety around academic tasks. Um, so, so there's definitely a connection there, uh, not for everyone, but um, there's increased risk for developing specific forms of anxiety um, if you're struggling with ADHD. And it's the same thing with learning disabilities. Individuals who really uh, struggle in certain topics at school and uh, have handwriting problems, for example, a lot of times will get very anxious about being judged, they'll get very anxious about uh, their performance, they'll get it might take them longer to get academic or um, other tasks done, um, and that can lead to anxiety. So um, anxiety can, can uh, become intertwined with ADHD very easily, um, and unfortunately, uh, ADHD and anxiety are really difficult to differentiate. So, uh, when we do testing with kids uh, with anxiety, a lot of times they actually look like they have ADHD. Um, so, when kids are, especially when kids get anxious, um, their mind tends to wander, uh, they get impulsive, and they start to look uh, like ADHD. So, that can be a really differ uh, difficult differential diagnosis. Great, thank you. So we had somebody else submit something. I recently discovered the anxiety slash Austin's disorder called pathological demand avoidance. My daughter with Tourette has this along with other comorbidities. Have you seen others with TS who have PDA? Um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, that... <laughs> It's a, it's a complicated question, um, and I, I'd like to unpack it. The short answer to your question is um, we don't see a lot of it, but it's also uh, in a not well understood um, diagnosis. And so I think there's more of it out there, but what we actually see is that they're diagnosed with um, other problems, especially think some of the older disorders like oppositional defiant disorder. Great, thank you. Um, another one, my son, now 16, has a few tics these days, medication and perhaps they are abating with age. Anxiety and depression are also very severe. May they also abate as he gets older if the tics are abating? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up and I wish I had put it into the, um, to the webinar today. So there's actually some research coming out. Um, there's mixed research coming out on that. And so um, for those of you who don't know, uh, anxiety or uh, tics, motor and vocal tics tend to take a waxing and waning course uh, with an overall worsening for most individuals up through adolescence. And then most individuals experience some 
leveling off or remission of symptoms or improvement of symptoms into adulthood. And so the question is always what happens with the comorbidities? Um, it does look like that there's a subset of kids for whom the comorbidities follow the ticks, but for the majority of kids, uh, things like anxiety and OCD um, tend to persist into adulthood. Um, so the, the take home I tell parents is that um, the prognosis for ticks is relatively good. Most individuals will have some improvement. There's no guarantee that we're gonna see, see the same thing with the anxiety and depression. Um, and so I would, those anxiety and depression are not problems that I would um, sit on. They're not problems that I would take a wait and see approach with. They're problems that I would be proactive and address early on. Um, the, with ADHD, we see something a little bit different. ADHD, um, if it persists into adulthood, actually tends to change a little bit in presentation for most people. Um, so we, we don't see quite the same level of non-compliance and hyperactivity, um, but we still do see things like impulsivity and risk-taking um, and distraction and the cognitive parts of ADHD. So um, that's a long answer. Um, if I had to sum it up, I would say there are no... Uh, for a lot of individuals, the comorbidity tends to take a more chronic course and needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. Do you want to take one more question, Dr. Hemley? Sure. Okay. How does Tourette syndrome complicate the diagnosis of depression and or anxiety as many of the symptoms seem to also run within a typical diagnosis of TS? Yeah, um, another great question. Uh, and it can be hard. It can It can be really hard to know whether the, the symptoms of anxiety and depression are related to the tics or whether um, they're making the tics worse. And in some ways, I mean, technically speaking, the diagnosis of Tourette involves the presence of motor and multiple motor and vocal tics that have been present for at least a year. Persistent tic disorders, motor or vocal tics, been present for a year. So the diagnosis of tic disorders is based just on the presence of those tic symptoms. So Diagnostically, it's not that hard to tease them apart because the anxiety and the depression, even if they're secondary to the tics, are still anxiety and depression. Uh, what's more difficult is to figure out how they're specifically related to the tics and how that should play out in treatment. So if the tics are really driving social anxiety, then treating the tics should help with the social anxiety. On the other hand, if you have social anxiety that's just making the tics worse, you'd want to focus on the social anxiety. So um, what I generally do, what we do in our program is we take a more comprehensive approach and try to focus on, on all of it um, to really, uh, I think everybody can learn, everybody can benefit from learning some mood and anxiety management strategies, uh, whether you have Tourette or not, um, whether you have anxiety or depression or not. Um, but especially people with anxiety and depression uh, that are comorbid with Tourette, um, we incorporate some of those anxiety and mood management skills into our treatment of the tics. Um, so diagnostically, it's not too hard to tease them apart. From a treatment standpoint, uh, it gets a little bit more uh, difficult. Great, thank you. So thank you again, Dr. Himley. This is all the time that we have tonight for our webinar. Once the webinar is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would please complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of tonight's webinar. There were quite a few questions that we didn't get to answer, so if you still need answers to your questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd be happy to get you the answers, whether it's through the Tri Association or Dr. Henley himself. Um, additionally, the webinar will also be posted on the Tri Association YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us on social media about this webinar or for other ideas and suggestions you may have. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking time to do our presentation. Have a great night.